Doesn't everybody preach with props? Come on. Will you pray with me? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Amen. So the readings today are two 316 passages, one you might be very familiar with and one you might not be familiar with at all. So who knows John 316? Do I need to read it? Okay, no, I don't. Who knows Leviticus 316? All fat belongs to the Lord which is actually one of my favorite 316 passages. I am so honored to be with you today. I'm so grateful that Linda and Chris have called me on this special day for a couple of reasons. One is 37 years is just a remarkable accomplishment. I can't tell you what it means to me personally that this place has been here welcoming me and all my queer siblings for so long. And I am so grateful to you for that. And the other is, they don't let theologians out very often to preach. <laughs> because we are deadly boring, as the recitation of my resume suggests. So I wrote this sermon before Vanderbilt became the football powerhouse. <laughs> we won two in a row, friends, come on. Before Vanderbilt became the powerhouse that it was. So what I want you to do when I read the beginning of my sermon is hold on to that fact, and when I start to talk about miracles, insert Vanderbilt. <laughs> I insert Vanderbilt. I thought today about introducing myself through my credentials, but that's actually extremely boring, and Linda did a great job. So what I thought I'd do is tell you my college football lineage. I grew up in the 60s and 70s when there was only a big eight. Does anyone remember? Okay, yes, my people. What are we like, not big 24? I, I, I don't know. But I grew up under the coach Barry Switzer, arguably the highlight of the University of Oklahoma. I thought that every football team won against their in-state rivals 66 to six. That's what I thought. That's what I thought football was. Well, my fan credibility should actually include this one semi-embarrassing, perhaps sinful story. Um, as a kid of 10 years old, I used to bake cupcakes and go to the stadium to sell them. But I wasn't there to make money. I was there to sneak in with the camera crew and watch the game for free. So that should tell you how serious I was about my football. So fast forward, for the last 30 years, I've been part of the Southeastern Conference, which actually now extends from coast to coast. We used to be the Southeastern Conference, and now we're basically absorbing the world. But I wasn't part of Alabama or Georgia or Florida. I was part of Vanderbilt. So when college game day came to Vanderbilt, the best we could do was hold up signs saying, our graduates are going to hire your graduates when football season is over. <laughs> However, that's actually not true, because their graduates went to the NFL and made a gazillion dollars. So the most we had was we were going to hire you. But one constant through my football lineage, and maybe yours too, has been a small cardboard sign in every end zone 
that read John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Someone was always witnessing at a football game. And this passage wasn't just weirdly child abusy. It's become part of the litmus test for being a certain kind of Christian. Another constant that's been, has been the fact that I've been surrounded by conservative Christianity my whole life. The ones that witnessed at football games in the end zones and the ones who lectured me from pulpits about why I was an abomination. And given this, I did what many liberal and progressive people do, which is I gave up the Bible. You can have it. You've used it in so many ways to hurt so many different people. Take it. Take all of it. But over time, I began to realize that the people who controlled biblical interpretation had a lot of social power, a lot of political power, and I wanted a piece of it. So I started to cultivate two dreams. One, to get a PhD in theology and teach seminarians another way to claim the biblical text, which I hope I've done. And the other is to stand in the end zone with a cardboard sign reading Leviticus 3.16, all fat belongs to the Lord. A sentiment for which I'm eternally grateful that my hips and thighs are actually pleasing to God. (laughs) And I think actually Leviticus 3.16 is more inspirational than John 3.16, but. But let's talk about Leviticus 3.16. It has a ritual and historic context. The Israelites were giving to God what was considered the best part of the ritual offering, which was the fat of the sacrificed animal. This is what was pleasing to God. Leviticus 3.16 has a ritual historical context. It's written in the Levitical code in which is also embedded other rules for people to live in exile. So there's a ritual, historical, and cultural intent for 316, but that means there's a cultural story for other passages in Leviticus, like 822 and 2013, two of the famous clobber passages. Before we look at these passages more specifically, let's just ask why, out of 613 commandments made for the Jews, we pull out two of them. We don't seem to care that in Leviticus 18.19, sex is prohibited with menstruating women. We don't seem to care that in Leviticus 19.19 and we're not supposed to wear mixed fiber clothing. No touching pig skin in Leviticus 11 through 8. No shellfish, Leviticus 11.10. This is selective literalism. People cling to these as absolute and ignore everything else that's inconvenient to them. The renowned New Testament scholar, Amy Jill Levine, who's one of my teachers and who, yes, is a force of nature, does a deep dive into all the clobber passages, which we're going to discuss in the workshop. But I want you to listen to a few things she has to say about these two. And they are those that say, you shall not lie with a man as with a woman. It's an abomination. uh, uh, Amy Jill Levine says, first, Leviticus says nothing about lesbians. So half of you can leave the room. (laughs) You're good. We're good. I'm good. We're all good. In Leviticus, and I'm trigger warning, I'm about to talk about body parts. For Leviticus, no penis, no ejaculation of semen, no problem. Thus, we see how the biblical text has a different definition of sexuality 
than we do today. Second good point, these commandments are addressed to Israel, not the Gentile nations. Since Christians today are generally Gentiles, that is not Jews, the laws given specifically to Israel, unless they're also repeated in the New Testament, are irrelevant. Christians need no more attend to Leviticus 18 and 20 than they need to attend to the shellfish prohibitions. Now, if some of you do keep the shellfish prohibitions, I apologize. These injunctions incur in a broader context of familial relations, of what we would call incest. Leviticus 18.9, for example, forbids brother-sister relations. Whether the sister is the daughter of the man's father or the daughter of the man's brother, presuming a blended family, the only other phrase, the only other time the phrase mikava, the lines of, appears elsewhere in the Torah, is in the context of incest. Thus, in the biblical view, Levine says, men do the, what the culture considers appropriate for men and the same for women, and today we call these gender roles, and we know that those rules are infinitely malleable. They're culturally constructed patterns of behavior which change over time. So finally, this text is about keeping categories separate. Men do what men do, women do what women do, those with cloven hooves do what they do, those without cloven hooves do what they do. Today's reader can take the good news that, um, that you male person shall not lie with a male as with a woman, and that means that a gay relationship does not need to correspond to a heterosexual relationship. Doesn't that freak you out? I mean, for so long, this passage has been about men not coming together, but really it's about keeping categories separate that we no longer think of as separate. So why in the world would we, would we continue to think that this passage means no gay relationships? The heterosexual relationship of man and woman need not apply to everyone. This is just a taste of why these two passages of the six are not about gay relationships. And it's just here that I want to add something. That the best use of the Bible for sexual ethics is not about how to love. It's not about who to love, but about how to love. This is a text about how we should love one another. But my message for you today is not just about the historical context of the clobber passages, but it's a plea. It's a plea to take this book back. It's yours, and it's mine, and it's not the property of hate mongers who've all been brutalized, which we've all been brutalized by for so many years. And you are the people for whom God is still speaking. And one way God still speaks is through the language of our tradition and through the biblical text. We have given up too much because some people have heard us with six random passages out of pages and pages of wisdom. Consider what we've lost when we give this up. We have lost the ability to call out sin because sin under the hands of the fundamentalist became personal and sexual. But in the book of Isaiah, commonly considered the fourth gospel or the model for the suffering servant, the sin for which the servant returns is not personal and sexual, it's communal. It's not caring for the widows and orphans. It's not being hospitable to those who need it. 
This is the model for the suffering servant in Isaiah. Israel and Isaiah practiced idolatry. Thus, we have in Isaiah both language and permission from the Bible to call out sin as systemic, as racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, sanism, and every other form of oppression and idolatry that predominantly white cisgendered conservative Christians try to obscure by constantly pointing to only individual same-sex behaviors. We have to reclaim this, this language, and we have to be able to call out evil when we see it. When was the last time you actually called out evil? Evil is the structural sins of slavery and the ongoing oppression imposed by Jim Crow laws and voter suppression through, through gerrymandered districts. My love for Vicki is not an abomination. Incarcerating and disenfranchising whole groups because they are people of color is evil and should be called out as such, both at the ballot box and in biblical interpretation. And we can't be sidetracked by forces that only care about queer love. There is literally no equivalence between my solid, faithful 28-year marriage and mass incarceration. We've given up the beautiful, transformative language of grace and miracle because we've gotten worn down hearing that God saves one middle-class man's daughter from a car accident as a miracle, while the daughters of Palestinian and Israeli fathers die every day by shrapnel. We gave away miracles because they made God look mercurial, and created an inhumane theology that seems to bless only those of us who don't live in a war zone. But we can reclaim the language of miracle as the everyday, ordinary love between two people who hope to care for one another into old age when we were told that we would probably live alone and closeted for the rest of our lives or the miracle that in many of our lifetimes we've seen the arc of history bend towards marriage equality. We reclaim miracles as the hard work of humans who are divinely inspired to think and work beyond ourselves for people we may never know. Take this language back. Reframe it. Deploy it. See miracles everywhere around you that have nothing to do with God randomly giving lottery tickets. While we decry decontextualized clobber passages, let us at the same time reclaim the wisdom, the love, and the grace, and the inspiration of this book that's for all of us. And perhaps, as we liberal and progressive Christians reclaim the power and the beauty of the Bible, we'll replace all the 316s with a little Mark and a little Matthew. Does anyone know what these are? 50 bucks. <laughs> Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen.